Well, welcome everyone to our latest edition of Shop Talk. I have been going through and studying for my CPSI exam that I have coming up. And so it was very timely for me to do a little bit of research and focus more on playgrounds, specifically now that it's starting to get cold out and um, it's a good time of the year to really start thinking about what are some of the things we should be looking at, what are some of those aspects that sometimes we forget about inspecting on a regular basis, and why not reach out to the experts to gain some insights and gain some of their wealth of knowledge. And so for this session of Shop Talk, we've invited Kevin Umbright, He's the vice president and district sales representative of Recreation Resource USA. He's going to share some of his expertise regarding playground safety and some maintenance aspects of things that we should be thinking about. Kevin himself is also a certified playground safety inspector, so he comes from some of that background and can use the language that we all should be familiar with. So for this session, we've asked Kevin to share his insights on important maintenance reminders and preventative efforts that we should all consider in our playgrounds, specifically before winter gets too hard on and the snow starts to fly. So Kevin started in park and playground business in 2013 after coming from a background as general manager of a small manufacturing firm, and then a few years supporting mission critical database software in the tech business. His background translates well to the world of playgrounds where manufacturing and continuous uptime need to be considered daily. So uptime for our industry often equates regular inspection, maintenance tasks, making sure that we're keeping track of our capital investments and making sure everything's functional and safe. Kevin resides in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania and enjoys cooking, music and hiking PA's beautiful state parks. He and his wife, Heather, have two in-house playground testers, age five and age two and a half. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kevin and let him take it off. Thanks, BK. I appreciate it. And thanks for everyone joining us. Uh, BK, I like that uh, uh, intro so much, I may just hire you to do that on a regular basis. It's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, everybody, thank you for coming. Thanks for um, uh, being with us. Uh, as BK said, um, I've been doing this seven years and playgrounds are a day-to-day -day thing for me. Um, I got my CPSI officially last year with uh, PRPS putting an event on near us at uh, West Whiteland Township, who was kind enough to host us for that. And so a uh, shameless plug for PRPS is uh, if you want to learn more about what you're doing with your playgrounds, go and take one of their tests. I think it's online or virtual this year, maybe. Um, but uh, it's a great course. You dig into a lot of details, some more than you uh, probably ever wanted to know, but it's well worth listening to if you deal with more than just one playground or one park or something like that. Um, so that's my plug on that. Um, I have a generic sort of playground maintenance presentation that I give. Um, I don't want to get too far into the weeds of it necessarily, but there are a lot of uh, things that um, you need to know as a background for playground maintenance uh, before you get into the nuts and bolts of it. No pun intended there. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, just start out and say, you know, basically what we're looking at is um, there's a huge amount of guidelines, standards, um, but, you know, why do we have the need for safe playgrounds? Uh, I think that should be fairly obvious, but there is, um, uh, you know, what makes an unsafe playground, what's a safe playground, and just other considerations. And I can get into other things off slides as well, um, because there are function to do, uh, like, hand raise or something like that that we would do or... Question Everyone right. can use the chat box to type any questions in. There also is that hand raise function. Um, and we are a small enough group here. You can always unmute yourself and just show your video. And then we can ask sure. questions that way too. Yeah, that'd be cool. Uh, don't hesitate to interrupt somewhere in the middle or, uh, you know, use the, one of the functions as mentioned. Um, so I'm going to give you the, the 
you know, this is the look at all the different standards that I work with on a day to day in the playground world. Um, probably don't need to know every single little detail about these. Uh, and what you should know is that you should reach out to your playground professional, whoever it might be that you work with, or I can help out or uh, something like that. So uh, the main one though, that you wanna look at for playground safety and maintenance um, is that one at the top there. Basically uh, that's the one, and you might see this in a question somewhere else is, um, what's the free book that contains the answers to any question you have out there about playgrounds? And that's that first one, the CPSC publication 325 public playground safety handbook. That is free um, for you to order as many as you want from the Consumer Product Safety Commission. I think you email info at cpsc.gov and you say, you know, dear sir, ma'am, uh, I would like to order this many of publication number 325, please ship to this address. They'll respond back and say, sure, you know, thank you for your order. This will arrive to you soon. And in a couple of days or weeks or whatever, you'll get a copy of that book. Um, so that's a great place to start. Uh, all the playgrounds generally these days are made to ASTM standards. Uh, so long as you buy it from one of the major playground manufacturing companies that's out there. Um, and you can really get, like I said, into the weeds about uh, the, the standards that are required and things like that. But um, ask your playground people that you work with uh, what, you know, in particular uh, questions you might have about any of these things that come up and how something complies or whatever it might be. And of course, the last one is the DOJ has an ADA standard which is federal law. So every playground now uh, is required by federal law to be accessible. And again, if you buy from one of the major playground manufacturers, you're going to get a playground that is accessible uh, per those requirements. Um, uh, the, the guidelines don't get into indoor uh, sculptures, uh, water play, splash pads, whatever, and home play equipment. Um, I'm going to jump into, let's see, uh, on a playground for, this is not necessarily a maintenance thing, but um, what they're saying is uh, any product that's installed outside of an equipment use zone can be treated as uh, just that, benches, tables, etc. And that does not apply to the playground world and playground safety standards. So a uh, playground is a uh, public space, uh, public playground you'll see is defined as something that's uh, uh, at a restaurant, somewhere that the public can get to, even if it is a private restaurant or a, uh, something like that. Uh, daycare, of course, a public park, um, uh, maybe a, a religious facility, something like that. That is technically a public playground per the standards. Some other key things that we'll look at are uh, play surfaces and what's a designated play surface protrusions. And this is where that's going to come into more of the maintenance aspect of things with the entrapments, protrusions, entanglements, uh, fall heights, things like that. So again, playground, uh, public playground is a, a place that is used by children six months, 12 years. And it's an area of commercial, non-residential facility, an institution, religious facility, school, resort, uh, community maintained parks, even HOAs. So those are uh, public parks or public playgrounds. Going through definitions here again, uh, designated play surface. So if you see up here at this uh, top corner, this is a designated play surface because it has a definition of an elevated surface for standing, walking, climbing, crawling, sitting, uh, that is wider than two inches by two inches and has an angle less than 30 degrees from horizontal. So technically that right there, top of that four by four post, that is a designated place surface by the book. Um, those are some of those things where older playgrounds or uh, things that are from lower tier manufacturers get put in place and then you know, something like that gets, uh, can get called out. What's the likelihood? Probably zero, but um, things like that may bring up issues in the future. Uh, 
this is the time at which you can correct those or have somebody out when you're in the winter time or approaching winter. This is the, the better time of the year, I would think, to go and do your maintenance. Um, there's no real good time to build a playground or to be working on a playground. They always need to be in use is what it seems like. Um, but this would be the time to resolve some of those things that are maybe not quite uh, right according to the book. Then we go into fall heights. Uh, of course, this comes into safety surfacing and uh, needing to have the proper safety surface and the proper height and things like that. Uh, fall height is a vertical distance between the highest designated play surface of the piece of equipment and the protective surface beneath it. Um, we use that number, but we also use it in conjunction with what's the critical height, which is a fall height below which a life-threatening head injury would not be expected to occur. So when we do these, we do these in uh, even number of feet, five foot, six foot, seven foot, eight foot, whatever that might be. Even if something is uh, like a swing set is at seven foot, nine inches, we say that the critical fall height rating of that piece of equipment is eight feet. And that's where we set our standards for, for the protective surfacing beneath it. An entanglement, uh, again, this gets into sort of maintenance things. The old S hooks are something that don't get looked at very much, but uh, you might think of it as just a piece of steel that is never going to break or anything like that. But the fact that you can fit a dime in between there, uh, that is an entanglement hazard. So watch your S hooks or clevises or whatever. Um, it's a condition in which a user's clothing is going to get caught and potentially uh, you know, cause a, a hanging or something like that. Um, we want to avoid anything on the playground that can you know, uh, present that hazard. A protrusion, and you'll see a gauge here. Uh, if you do need some guidelines on the gauges that are required, that's in the back of that public playground handbook. And they'll tell you the size and the shape of that piece of pipe. You can make your own out of PVC or a piece of wood or something like that to uh, do your test. Um, you can buy these kits as well, but a protrusion is uh, it's a projection on a piece of equipment. When tested, it's found to have a hazard. Um, basically, if it sticks out further than the top of the gauge, it could poke an eye or a temple or an earlobe or something like that when somebody runs into it or impacts it. We want to avoid those. This is, again, a great time of the year to go look for those things. Find them on your playground. Eliminate the hazard. An entrapment. Entrapment is something where you'll see right there, that's the, um, there's a flat torso probe. And if the torso passes through, then also a head gauge must pass through. The theory is if one part of the body goes through, you have to have the head pass through, else you can get caught. Um, generally, if you buy a manufactured system, these will not have any of those issues on them whatsoever, but there's still a chance and it's a best practice to always be looking at these. Once in the ground, once installed, it's probably not going to exist, but the best uh, thing to do is always keep your eye on uh, openings like this, especially older pieces of equipment because things have changed over the years and these things may exist. Again, the torso probe is a, as you'll see on my screen, it's a fifth percentile for a two-year-old child. So it's a tiny, tiny, tiny little torso and the comparison for the head is a 95th percentile 12 year old. So one of the biggest uh, sizes of heads for a, uh, an older child. Uh, we, we test for the opposite ends of the spectrum because we want those to be the things that pass through appropriately. Uh, that way there's no question whatsoever that if it, you know, something is safe, then it, it's safe. I have on their five-year-old child, I believe that number is a 12-year-old child. I'll define a use zone, and I think a lot of folks know about these. The use zones are the six-foot bubble around the entire playground that has to be maintained um, so that if a child falls off or is exiting from the playground, uh, jumping off, let's say, uh, some of us might have done that when we were younger, um, that that's where they're going to land and you don't want to put any other piece of equipment there for them to impact. Um, 
there's slide exits used to be treated a little bit differently and it's a best practice to keep slides exiting out away from a uh, path of travel, for example, something like that. And, and uh, swings are to be two times the beam height, we, is what we use technically as pivot point, but uh, like an eight foot high beam has to have twice the height of the beam to the front and twice the height to the rear. So 16 feet overall would be that distance. Um, we don't wanna have anything in there because some of us might've jumped off the swings when we were younger. And if you were to fly off one way or the other, it'd be about that far and you wanna have that safety bubble around. That's a absolute no-no. There are some spaces where you can overlap, like you see on the stepping forms up at the top there. Um, you can have some pieces uh, spaced appropriately together, but uh, those numbers will vary for the age groups two to five or five to 12. And actually some states like New Jersey, uh, I think Michigan, I think Illinois, I think California, they have legislated that you can or cannot do those things. Every state is a little bit different. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, we generally follow the CPSC guidelines, excuse me, as just that guidelines more than anything, but it's a best practice to stay to the book, which I mentioned here. Uh, DOJ mandates though compliance with the federal ADA guidelines. That is federal law and we cannot do anything else. Uh, it doesn't matter this state, any other state nearby, that's federal law that has to be ADA compliant. So of course, with a safe playground that's maintained well, you know, we're, we're watching liability uh, for your organization. Um, and of course, you know, uh, we want to keep things obviously like death and injury, uh, lawsuits, public perception about how you maintain your playgrounds or, you know, if somebody starts smearing somebody about having the bad playgrounds or whatever it might be, and you, know, you have to protect your reputation, of course. But at the end of the day, it's most importantly because it's about the kids. You know, that's what we're trying to do is provide a safe space for them to take risks. Kids learn by taking these risks. We're giving them a safe space. Uh, I'm gonna jump through a little bit of my slides here because they're more on statistics or anything like that. Um, I wanna get into sort of the nuts and bolts of maintenance. Um, one thing that comes up a lot is uh, replacement programs. Um, some places are maybe um, a little bit better off with that where something is approaching end of life and it'll be considered as something that's going to be replaced. Other places it's easy to put it off, put it off, put it off, put it off as a deferred maintenance item. But playgrounds have a lifespan and it doesn't last forever. It's in one of the harshest environments. Uh, in Pennsylvania here, we have a huge amount of heat in the summer and the humidity. Uh, and then we have, of course, the cold and the ice and the rain in the wintertime. So we do have pretty harsh environments. I, I think I saw somebody on the list was maybe from Wisconsin. So you probably know about that stuff too a bit. But um, yeah, we got to make sure that we have a program. Um, and then just staying on top of the regular types of maintenance items. Most playgrounds will last and just stay as they are. But of course, we have to watch for any changes that might occur over time, whether it be from uh, environmental factors or uh, uh, neighborhood uh, vandalism, things like that. We have to watch and be vigilant with the maintenance. These are sort of the things that you can walk around your playground on a, uh, about this time of the year and, and really take a good look around at stuff and see if you can find these things. So there's an, uh, the entanglement hazards. On the left side, you have an S hook and if anyone still carries coins around, if you put a dime in there, that's sort of the tester for that. Um, many, many, many playgrounds have switched over to doing the clevises as opposed to the uh, S-hooks, but you know, something like that's a cheap, easy fix uh, this time of the year. Um, and then on the right side, that's an improper bolt, most likely. I say that because the bolt on the uh, on the left side of your screen there is a hex head as opposed to a button head that has a rounded head. Something like that can catch a string or something like that. Just like the on the right side, um, 
not only is it an entanglement where it can catch a string, but it's a protrusion. Uh, generally, you're looking for two threads or less. Um, there may be a gauge that prevents that from being a protrusion. I don't think so, though, based on looking on that. These, a lot of these are not my photo. They're great photos that I've found or had shared with me over the years. So um, I don't have any more context with that. I believe once you test that, though, with that protrusion gauge, you would find that that would be a protrusion hazard, even though the likelihood is very small. That's an easy thing to fix, uh, and I'll get into maybe not a how, but um, you know, what the best practice would be. Um, on the left side there, technically that clevis doesn't have a spacer on it, which would make it an entanglement. Uh, if you look at your shackles, uh, they have enough space there that with the gauge, that becomes a, an entanglement hazard. On the right side, the bolt's facing up. That's an easy one. That's probably an install error, but uh, just flip them around, put them the other way, and most likely you've solved the problem. A lot of these things are easy. On the left side, you just put a bunch of washers in there, stack them up so it becomes uh, that it's not an entanglement. Here's another spot, especially at the top of a slide, the gap that's up there. Um, unknown what might have happened, but uh, there are ways to either fill that or adjust the slide. Uh, there may be bolts down below that have been loosened, something like that, but um, that's the gauge that's used again. It's in the back of that uh, public playground handbook where you can order a set or you can have your CPSI come out and test it. Uh, on the right, you can see the slide where the gaps have opened up a little bit. And that would be an entanglement. This one was, uh, this had a hole in it. If you can see the, uh, on the far side of the slide there, just either years of use or something like that. But um, that was something that was, that was big enough to catch my pinky in there. Uh, that's a photo that I took somewhere. So we resolved that very quickly. There's another slide with a gap. Um, this happens very commonly in the winter time. Uh, some stuff fits together better than others, but um, that might be just something that needs to be tightened down a little bit more. Incorrect parts on playgrounds. And this goes back to why you should probably call your manufacturer, your manufacturer's rep to get the right parts. Um, uh, the one on the left there, there's no shackle uh, and pendulum. So we have steel on steel. And so obviously that bolt is pretty much gone. Um, on the right side, acorn nut on, I don't even know what that is, on top of another washer or something like that. It, I see you laughing, BK. This is kind of my, I, I kind of like to call this my don't section of the presentation. They're, they're funny, but it's bad. So, um, somebody was not being, they were, thought they were being creative. You can see it was yeah. definitely a yeah. fix it real quick. And then they may not have gone back or wrote it down that they needed to fix that properly. Well, and a lot of it is, is um, uh, knowledge because a lot of the CPSI and the, the ASTM and all the specs and things like that are very particular on what you can and cannot use. And somebody is well meaning with this, truly, they're trying to solve a problem but it's not the right way to solve the problem. So um, always use the resources you have available to you. And most of those resources are free. Here's a protrusion. Again, we're looking for two threads generally uh, poking out at most. Here's one um, that was basically just mulch that was maybe a dusting on the ground which I'll start talking about surfacing in a little bit. Here's one that I saw. It was, um, that's actually asphalt where there was a patch of port in place that was cut out. So somebody was paving over here and they said, oh, there's a big hole there. It's a tripping hazard. Let's put this in over here to make it come up level. And they just put asphalt at the base of a slide. Um, that project uh, or that site was torn down so it's resolved. Um, that was a housing authority uh, near us that did that one. 
protective surfacing. Uh, this is a great time of the year to do some of these things. Um, and I'm not sure what uh, the, everybody has in terms of surfacing, but um, I wanted to, uh, well, I won't do my, I won't stop my screen, but for the poured in place rubber, uh, this would be a good time to get the rubber tested for doing drop tests. Um, there are some independent testers out there and I can share those names uh, with somebody that would like uh, to, to have more information. But um, we hire a drop tester that is independent of us and our surfacing manufa manufacturer in order to get these surfaces tested. We wanna make sure that we're getting what we pay for where our clients are getting what they pay for. And so we just had somebody out, they did three of them for me recently, um, two in Philadelphia and one in Doylestown area. But it's great, it comes back with a report and it says that here's how your surface performed um, and is it as expected and what's the thickness of it and so on and so forth. So uh, it's a great time of the year to do it. When we do the certification tests for our manufacturers or that when the manufacturers do it, um, they test them, you may see, hear this question again soon, is uh, they test them at low temperatures, about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. They test them at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit and 120 degrees Fahrenheit. So when we do those drop tests in a lab condition, they'll pull something out of their freezer, uh, something at room temperature and something from a heater to make sure that the surfacing complies with the drop test and the expected performance across all of those temperatures so that we get the real world type of performance. One other recent thing that happened was they started doing drop tests on edges of tiles or at a seam between two pieces of rubber or something like that so that it would be more of a, let's call it worst case, real world test, which I think is a great thing instead of having you know, the best perfect piece of your rubber or your rubber tile or whatever. Uh, they're testing those things so that no matter where you fall on that surface, you're always going to get the performance that is uh, required. Um, the two tests, uh, the, the data that you get back, uh, there's a head impact criterion and there's a GMAX. Those are the two numbers that are the score. And to put it in perspective, the National Highway and Transportation Safety Administration, NHTSA, um, for an impact for an, with an airbag, they said that uh, the value of 700 is allowed under the laws that were uh, created about 2000 for airbags. And that is the max score as an acceptable score for the IIHS. So, Hopefully nobody's been through a car crash before, but to put it in perspective, um, if you were to smack your head on the airbag, the max value is 700 for the uh, head impact criterion. On a playground, the max score that they usually give for a rating is 1000 and a HIC value of 1000, um, the numbers they say are there's an 18% probability of severe head injury, 55% of uh, serious head injury probability, and 90% chance or probability of a moderate head injury. So I guess the question becomes, why do we put in playground services that have a hick just below 1,000 when we know that that's the, the probability? Um, and what we usually do is we'll put in something that has that uh, rating of HIC of 1000 that um, we'll put it in knowing that we far exceed that number. And so our HIC values are coming out much lower, the six, 700 range to avoid those problems. Um, and then GMAX is sort of a uh, very similar thing, but again, to put it in perspective, uh, the GMAX score that the athletic synthetic turf field companies all use as a standard is 165 or less. A HIC value of the, uh, 1000 is a 200 G max. So that kind of puts it in perspective that, you know, the 165 is down um, not 75, maybe 80%, whatever that number is uh, of what 
the max should be. So um, over the years, your surfacing is going to get harder and things like that. So we really want to put that surfacing in that is a much lower value with the intent for it to be able to climb slightly over the years and through all the different temperatures. Uh, so it doesn't become unserviceable or, or unusable at all. Um, for the poured in place rubber like sh is shown here, uh, that's actually something that we do patches for those in some cases. Something like this one that has a slide exit that's down to, it looks like the aggregate base. Um, that would be a, 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 you know, something where we'd say, well, it's probably approaching end of life. But for small areas of poured in place rubber for patching, especially the top coat, that's something that we can do or we can show you how to do it. It's not really hard, um, but it's something to keep on top of. Uh, there are some places that do their own and they do a good job of it. Uh, for the poured rubber, if you get uh, a day like today that's kind of nice and warm, uh, you can easily patch it and have it set up with hopefully the anticipation there might be a little bit less traffic on the playground on a day like today instead of the summertime. For the tiles, um, that gapping can be a little bit tricky. Uh, in the cold, we get gaps. and In the heat, we get them uh, pushed together and sort of cup them. Um, I'm not gonna make a you know, product recommendation or anything like that, but um, yeah, fixing that gapping can be a little bit more tricky depending on the tile system that you have. Um, I'm gonna move on then to some other of these. Uh, I like this one here is, uh, there must not be a barrier in place because as you can see on the right, I can reach further than you. I, I kind of like that one um, as a oops moment. For those of you that might have systems with clamps around the posts, uh, that's something to watch for. The steel and the aluminum of the clamp can expand and contract at different rates and clamps will just break. Uh, so this happens a little bit, well, I can't say it happens more often in the, the winter or the cold. We do get those calls on some of our older systems that were not a direct bolt, but that's something to absolutely look for on your playgrounds. And they can be hard to see, but most likely they're gonna be warranted, warranted for life as it's a key component, but that's something that's uh, somewhat common. This one was near us that we found. Yeah, that's just unsafe. Um, doesn't comply, that's an original install issue. Not much to do there. There are some bolts that are facing upward. I think that's what they were going for here, but maybe of more concern would be the paint on this. Um, paint's a tricky one. Uh, colder weather, it's harder to do touch-ups, but the more you can stay on top of the, the areas that might rust in the future, the better. And then there are some things like this. Uh, that I always, always, always look for. Uh, this one was over at a school somewhat near us and I was going along with the maintenance folks and we were looking at their playground and I always go over and, and kind of shake the chains to see if the shackle moves and then shake it the other way to and fro to make sure that they move freely and ro uh, rotate correctly. But this one was locked up and what had happened was this S-hook was just rotating steel on steel. And fortunately, I found it when I did, and I said, you know, we're going to replace that because that's just completely unsafe. But these spots, as well as any other place that might have steel on steel, are uh, high wear areas, especially on motion components, swings, and things like that. So for a part that costs eight, 10, 12 bucks, whatever it is, you know, this is a major, major, major incident waiting to happen. So be cognizant on those high wear areas uh, of what you're looking for. And swings is a great thing to look at all, all the time. Original install issue, it's a playground that has a, a uh, not a full barrier that's up higher than six feet. But something like that could be ordered in the off season, put on and uh, be back up and working.
some pods that are banging together. Again, this, uh, this was original install issue, but um, things should not be impacting together. That's a crush hazard. Now's the time to take the chains at the anchor at the bottom, cut them off or otherwise uh, take up a few links so that it's tighter and they don't bonk together so that kids won't get uh, you know, bonked in there. This is an older playground, and this would be something that a, a CPSI would find on an older playground. This is called a partially bound opening. There's a gauge that looks like a fish, and uh, if you can put the fish head down to a certain level, you kind of hold where your, your hand is across there, and then you put the tail side in that's skinnier. If the tail can go further down than where the head went, that's called a partially bound opening, where in theory, a head could be on this side and a torso on this side. And uh, this was at ground level, but still, uh, if you got in there in that circumstance because you were climbing this the wrong way or trying to climb up over and you fell and you slipped and you went in, uh, that would be a place that would be difficult or impossible to get out of. And if it was above platform, which there was something over on uh, the structure nearby this, uh, that, that would be a strangulation hazard. So little things like this, that you get a professional come out and walk around and look at it. Um, you know, you may find these, these uh, things that can be resolved either by taking this panel off or uh, the manufacturer might have a retrofit kit or something to that effect where you could put a bracket up here and get rid of that hazard. You can see on these panels, they do have like block offs. So this was an original manufacturing uh, problem, most likely. Basically, you know, if, if we look at our playgrounds on a regular basis, uh, you're going to end up with a safe playground that's uh, uh, friendly, a place for kids to, to go learn and take risks appropriately without having uh, huge amounts of, of liabilities there that can cause problems and, and uh, injuries. So consider maybe in this off season as well, putting up some risk management signage. This area has been designed for age five to 12, two to five, two to 12, whatever it might be. And then the standard um, three warnings that are on all playgrounds, and actually some companies have gone to four, but these three are required. Basically, don't use a playground without safety surfacing beneath it that's appropriate for the fall heights. Things get hot when they're in the sun, so be careful that you don't burn yourself. And don't wear loose clothing, helmets, or things like that when you're playing on the playground because they may present hazards that uh, are strangulation hazards or it would get caught on the piece of equipment. A lot of manufacturers have gone to the, the next one um, and added a fourth one that says basically, don't take your kids down the slides with them riding in your lap. Um, it's something that came up based on a YouTube video that went uh, and got pretty popular. Uh, it was a mother warning of her daughter riding in her lap and basically with her weight behind her daughter, when her daughter's foot got stuck on the side of the slide, uh, her daughter's ankle broke. And uh, it's something that we see at public parks and you can go over and say something to somebody, but that sort of helps to remove and reduce some of the liabilities uh, that yes, there was signage. Um, the other thing that you may find helpful is if you have your signs or your uh, stickers, usually the stickers come with the playgrounds and are to be adhered to the posts as a last step before the installer leaves. You can call the manufacturer and they will probably give you free copies of stickers uh, or original order sticker uh, that's to be placed on the posts. A lot of times they don't make it on there. Uh, with our install team, we make sure that they put them on appropriately so that wherever you're standing around the playground, you can see the sticker generally. Uh, you know, re so somewhat of a reduction of liability is what it's there for. But um, uh, yeah, call your manufacturer, call your sales rep, ask them for a set of stickers for, their pl for your playground, uh, and most likely the manufacturer will send them out to you. Of course, there's ADA compliance in the modern era. Uh, same deal, this would be the time to make sure that your playground has a, a sidewalk into it or 
has areas that um, can be accessed by all users. And other resources, um, and this is uh, probably something that you'll hear about as well, um, other than that free book, uh, you know, who do you call for any questions about regular maintenance if you don't find it in some of these books? And the answer is call your sales rep, call your manufacturer of your playground equipment. They should be able to give you the answers. The answers are free. All you have to do is call and ask the question. We have technology now where you can text me or text your sales rep or whoever it might be and say, hey, this is what I have at my site. I have this issue or I have this question. Is this appropriate or is that appropriate? And it's very likely that you know, we can set up a time to do even a FaceTime or a whatever it is, a Zoom or who knows what if you're on site and we can talk and discuss. Uh, and that'd be for a remote thing, but you know, we're still doing uh, our socially distanced um, uh, park meetings with our clients as well. So no excuse not to call and ask and you know, send a picture or an email or whatever and, and find out. Um, same deal with, uh, you know, the, the install prints. That's why you, we keep our original install manuals um, or call the manufacturer. They can probably send you a PDF if you've lost yours or it's you know, changed hands or got lost somewhere over the years. Um, ask them for a copy of it. It has everything in there that you could possibly need to look at parts and pieces and make sure that you have the right bolt. If one looks shiny and the rest are not quite as shiny, is that the right bolt? Uh, or if something fell out, who knows? And make sure you get the right bolt from them. Uh, I carry a kit in my trunk. And if I'm out with somebody and they say, oh, I have this part here, I'm going to my trunk. I'm going to find the piece, see if I have it. And here you go. So use your sales reps, your manufacturers uh, as a resource for everything that you need to do for maintenance of your playground. Um, one last thing that I don't have on here necessarily is um and i think bk i might have sent them to you at some point i have like a checklist for maintenance and they give a recommended interval for a weekly a daily um a monthly or a yearly type of look around at your playground it's a great idea to keep those on file so that if anything were ever to happen and you need to be audited you can prove that yes we did this test and here was the last date that we did it and it's signed in here. And you know that was according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Uh, I know that in our install manual, in our owner's manual, that we have a chart that shows the recommended maintenance. Most likely any other manufacturer that's out there will have that as well as part of their installation manual. So if you don't, uh, if, if you don't wanna use my copy that has our name on it, then use your manufacturer's copy that they have their name on it. They know their equipment and what their interval should be. But that um, that's an easy call. That's a free PDF file, something like that, that you can print, duplicate, and use at your parks. But um, those things are all uh, free, and they will tell you exactly when the checks are to be performed uh, per the manufacturer's schedule. We have stored those resources in our tool shed, as well as I've been collecting uh, multiple different manufacturer recommendations, as well as um, even checklists that I've been finding from other municipalities. And so that way, um, we've been storing all of those kind of things in our tool shed. Um, and you can always reach out to me and I can help you find where those things are at. Sure. And the folks that gave the, the talk last year and the, did the class for PRPS that I took, um, they were fantastic. They came from other areas of the country and they had some very great tools. Um, and I'm sure that they would share them. They gave out their email addresses. They said, hey, email if you ever want a copy of this or how we do stuff or whatever. So the instructors for PRPS uh, in conjunction with NRPA were great with what they provided in terms of information and resource as well. Uh, and they're just people that want to have nice, safe playgrounds because that's what they're invested in on a daily basis for their organizations, too. So uh, I think the one uh, instructor was in charge of something like 20 or 30 or 40 schools. It was some crazy number like that. So they definitely had their handle on 
doing playgrounds and how to keep track of everything. Um, and it was around, if I remember correctly, the DC area. So in that system, they use their county as the, the central hub, and then they have one school district for the entire county. So uh, I know that's different as uh, compared to here in PA, um, but I mean that think about the number of elementary schools in one county, and that's what they were dealing with there. So um, yeah, here in PA, you can find a school district that goes across three counties. You know, <laughs> yep, right? Five hundred school districts in the state. So uh, they're all different. They're all different size, different elementary. But yeah, uh, so. Getting back on track, I guess, uh, you know, obviously the, the real keys come to design and installation up front. That's where the majority of your things are, but the, the maintenance can be an ongoing thing that you know you, you got to keep up with. And when it becomes part of your property, then it, it's on you to do the maintenance. So, um, and of course, the, when using it, supervision is helpful too. I know that doesn't always happen in public parks, but uh, those are the keys to having a safe playground. And really, like I think I mentioned before, that children learn from taking risks. And it's our job to eliminate the hazards that they may encounter when taking these risks. Um, a safe place, a playground is no accident. So uh, I hope that I covered some of the maintenance aspects of a playground. Um, I don't know if there are specifics that anybody has questions about that I could share any uh, tricks and tips about, but uh, I'm here if anyone has any phone calls or emails or wants to reach out, connect us, BK. I'm sure you can do that. And be happy to I help do have one you. question that I was reached out to by sure. um, a, someone was asking specifically on surfacing and yeah. they have poor in place surfacing where it's, you know, the multicolor and there's different area zones and they're, eventually, you know, wear and tear, kids start picking at those seams and um, you, you start developing a need for a patch or a need for a, you know, a bead of something to go in. Is, mm -hmm. is there, uh, is that something that is at the, you know, once it's installed, you're pretty much stuck with what you got or is there ways to go back and patch those things or is there a best, a best practice to think about when you're at that you know, design yeah. point too. So seams are sometimes a reality of poured in place surfacing. The way that the poured in place rubber cures is by pulling moisture out of the air. And so on a more humid day, your playground is going to actually set up really fast compared to a day like today that might be cooler and lower humidity. When you pour a rubber surface, I know there are companies that say that they only do a certain amount of square feet per day. Um, we don't have that limitation. Uh, we just did a top with graphics in Philadelphia. I think it was about 46 or 4,700 feet in one day. So that's part of it. When you pour it all on the same day with the same weather conditions, your seams are usually a non-issue at all. When you have a different company do it that has uh, maybe a multi-day pour or I've seen where people will put in the entire area as a solid color and then make cuts on the dried surface and then pour their color graphic whatever it is inside of where they cut. That's when you probably have more issues. So Yes, that can be an issue um, that you have to look at on the installation side. I hope that you do your research with that because um, when you buy a surface, you're spending a lot of money to buy it. And hopefully it's from somebody that has a reputable brand or name or has a lot of square footage around that you can look at that's a couple of years old or older and see how it really stands up. But in order to bring those seams together is it's a difficult question to answer. Um, you can do a couple of things. You can actually cut more away and then add a, like a border or something like that around the edge of it. But most likely if those surfaces have shrunk apart, you're never going to get them back together. Um, 
And that's where you start coming into creative solutions about how to get it back together. Um, but yeah, shrinkage in rubber is a tricky, tricky sort of thing to deal with um, if it wasn't poured right up front. Uh, I don't know if that helps to sort of answer the question at all. Uh, usually when we come across something like that, we kind of look at the overall, how old is it? How good of shape is it in? And if you create more cuts, you're probably going to create more seams and those seams may get Oop, did you freeze? App worse now. So it depends on a lot of different factors. I hope that helped. Oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Yeah, you froze so up for a moment there. I, I guess what I was getting to is it's just a tricky circumstance altogether. And it has to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis, really, to see what can or cannot be done. Kevin? Yes. Uh, that was actually my, my playground that BK is talking about. Okay. Um, it's old and we are planning to replace it. Sure. Um, the problem is, you know, taking it, it was supposed to be done this year right. um, because of COVID and, you know, fundraising, we're trying to hold off for another year with the surface. Sure. Is there anything, and we know uh, everything you said, I, I get. Um, is there anything, we've cut it out before, we did fix it, and it has since gotten worse, and kids do, they pulled up the, yep. you know, pull it up. Is there anything we can put in it or, or do to get us through another season or another half a season, really? You know, like uh, the, 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 rubber, the rubber bits, mm -hmm. you know, the, the rubber mulch, put that in. Is there anything we can do? Yeah. Matt's over. I don't know. Just trying, okay. you know. And it, so you're open for anything, basically. Right. Um, for another season, if you really wanted to do this, you could put mulch over top of it. Mm -hmm. The thing that you'll come into there is obviously that it's a waste of money. Um, I've seen where people have bad old rubber surfaces and you just put mulch over top of it, borders around it, and walk away because they usually then say, well, that playground's good for another 20 years. Oh, no. And yeah, right. So I'm working with somebody on this that they just got a new playground surface put in and it's already shedding granules like crazy mm -hmm. because the original installer didn't put any glue in it at the right ratio. And so now it's just completely coming apart. Well, they ask the same sort of question. What can I do to prolong its life? The unfortunate problem is it just depends on the original install and how that was done. Uh, how old is your surface? Oh, you know? it's like 13. Yeah, it's, it's old. It needs to be replaced. Well, it's, it's the, the same thing like a consumer grade. Um, do you want to put new tires on your car that's got 300,000 miles right. on it and then right. a check engine light? So, I mean, I, we, don't want to, we don't want to close the playground. You know, right. I mean, we've, we've oh, closed yeah. it to make the repairs, you know, two years ago or whenever it right. was. You know, time flies, so maybe it was a little bit more. True. But, you know, we're just trying to get it for demolition, you know, next October. Yeah, and that's a tricky one because then if, if you start doing patches, I mean, the granules are cheap and the glue is relatively cheap. Um, we could show you how to do that and you could buy the materials and, the, you know, fill in where you think it's needed. But... It just becomes such a tricky thing to see how much money to put into it when you know it's coming out. So, yeah, I, I don't really have a great answer well, for that. I, I, I appreciate your I appreciate your answer. Yeah, I just want to be honest. I'm a salesperson, but I'm, I'm I get it. I don't want to sell you something that's not going to work for a year, and you're just going to get there and say, "Well, you know, right, we're tearing it out anyway." So, what company do you use um, for your port in place surface? Surface America. Yeah. Well, who's that? Surface America? Yes. Yeah, yeah we have a, a, an exclusive re agreement with them that we do all their work here in Pennsylvania and Delaware. Yeah. And the crews that they have in this area are awesome. Yeah, we, we've used them for one of our, our Miracle League field. We're familiar. Yes, right. They do all the Miracle League fields. Yep. They have a deal with 
Miracle League to do that. And um, uh, I hope that one's holding up okay. Well, we had issues, but that's another story. <laughs> that's another story, okay. Yeah, and rubber is a tricky animal. It really is uh, dependent on the crew that you have come in. And I have the same crew come in every single time. Um, they travel from Boston to DC to Iowa to Ohio to Pennsylvania to Michigan to wherever. And they're just all over the place all year. And they do awesome work for me. I just love these guys. So great. Thanks so much. Yep. A lot of materials question, you know, talking about longevity. I mean, people think, well, metal lasts forever. I mean, is there a, is there a real uh, a best practice of those kind of things? Or are the composites more powerful today? Or what are you finding that people have moved towards or are moving away from in your experience? Actually, I like that question. You put something back into my head. Um, on the, on the, like the metal posts, Pretty much everybody is using a galvanized post that's then painted. Um, and galvanized is self-healing. So when you coat it with the powder coat, powder coat is a spray-on um, electric static charged uh, powder that attaches itself to the post. So it has a positive charge, the powder hasn't, or the uh, yeah. powder has a positive charge, the negative charge is on the post. It adheres to it. And it goes into an oven and it's melted and it makes like a candy shell basically is kind of a good way to put it. Um, if that were to chip off, then spray paint is the easiest way to, to coat that again. Um, but if it's not, then you're generally okay because it's a galvanized steel pipe, uh, kind of like a fence post or something like that. Galvanized is self-healing. Um, when you talk about metal for playground platforms, I know that a lot of folks have seen that sort of shrink away over the years or something like that, uh, or get worn away, especially on little thin areas like the sides of stairs or something like that. In the past couple of years, they made this product available to us now called Flex Seal. I don't know if you've seen those uh, infomercials. A guy has a screen door and he sprays it with the stuff and then he's driving a boat or something like that because of it. It's basically the same vinyl that's on the playground decks and it's at Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever it might be. So you can get that stuff pretty affordable compared to you know going and it's a specialty product from a playground manufacturer or whatever. We do have patch kits that are available, but if I can go to Costco and get a two pack of Flex Seal that's clear for like 10 or 15 bucks, that's the easy button. Spray it on. And I think you can get brown spray, blue spray, whatever to match your platforms. That will get you through to take the um, possibility of rusting away from the metal. If you seal it back up again, even if it's rusty, you've taken away oxygen and now it doesn't have the opportunity to oxidize any further or rust anymore. Of course, there's a limit of you know, how much good metal is there in there any longer, but if you can solve that problem generally of, of um, slowing or stopping that rusting process from occurring, then you're be much better off. The modern playground platforms uh, are made out of usually a solid piece of steel that has holes punched in it, and they're getting much, much, much better, uh, especially with the, the brands that use the small perforations. There are some brands that use big perforations, but yeah, the small ones have so much more vinyl coating on them uh, that they'll last much, much longer than the days of old that were the expanded metal. So uh, that's been a positive thing. Um, when you talk about uh, composites or plastics or whatever, yeah, we've come further with the plastics a bit, but your basic recycled uh, slats or something like that, those are still... Oh, your internet froze up again there. It's tricky because they still use the same plastic. Days of plastic are basically the same as the new sort of stuff. The processes have not changed much year over year. So um, I wouldn't put too much stock in the plastics uh, simply because 
there's just there it's no competition for the metal and the vinyl and those things well that's that's helpful thank you and i want to respect everyone's time but there's a very good question here uh, Basically, it's asking, you know, should you schedule a detailed inspection on your playground kind of before your warranty runs out to take advantage of any last minute warranty replacements? Is that kind of something to do? That's actually a pretty good idea um, because and you have to watch your warranty periods because a lot of companies will have a warranty period that's five years for this, seven years for this, 10 years for that, 15 years for that, 25 for that and lifetime for the posts. So maybe evaluate based on five years on or something like that, or 10 years on and see where you are. Generally though, you know, out in the, the uh, Pennsylvania suburbs, we have areas that will support a playground for 20, 25 years. Um, in areas of higher, more dense population, more use then you may get a few less years out of it, but absolutely. Um, Schedule your your walk with your sales rep or something like that, and you know take a look at an old structure and see what's what. Um, that's something that we do as part of our installations. In some cases, is we'll do a, a warranty period where we actually will come out and replace any warranty parts for people for free, uh, because our warranty parts are free for their entire term. Um, so I don't want to get too far afield here with. Uh, stuff but, but we have a 15 year warranty on our slides and if it has a crack that is developed after year 14 day 300 you say hey kevin i need a slide piece or whatever it's a free replacement free freight and then if we offer it as part of our original purchase we do free installation of that part so you have no cost of ownership uh, i think other companies will say well you owe us you know instead of five grand it's four because you're most of the way through your warranty period um but yeah, we, that's a good idea, something to look at. Um, and it just totally depends on you know, who put it in, uh, how they put it in, things like that. Uh, hopefully that's all nailed down though. Front. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone for your participation today. Uh, I wanna respect everyone's time. We have hit our 130 mark and we're a little beyond that, but Kevin, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. It's, Kevin's from Recreation Resource USA, based here in Pennsylvania. Uh, I put his contact details in the chat box earlier. Um, and please also check out the Institute website. All of the resources that we've talked about for the standards and those kind of things can all be found in the tool shed, as well as that checklist that Kevin was talking about on those weekly, monthly, annual inspection checklists. And um, reach out, please. Uh, my email is bk, like Burger King, at prps.org. Uh, feel free to uh, share your thoughts. Let me know what kind of questions you have and let us know how we can best help you. We're trying to put all the resources you need all in one place. So thank you, everyone. Uh, I look forward to hosting you again soon. Thanks for having me.